Hi, everyone. Judge Andrew Napolitano here for Judging Freedom. Today is Wednesday, December 6th, 2023. Tony Schaefer joins us. Tony, we've missed you. Hey, good morning. Welcome, welcome back to the show. It's always a pleasure uh, to chat with you. Uh, good to be here. How, how did Ukraine lose the war with Russia? <laughs> Let me count the ways. So I, I think let's start off with the most obvious. There's no strategy. Uh, there was never a strategy. It was all about simply trying to what I would uh, describe as virtue signal at the international level. Uh, we wanted to see NATO uh, be uh, embrace the Ukrainians with training all over the uh, the NATO ranch. We sent all the people out with no idea how you're going to actually uh, apply the training and uh, tactics to the battlefield. And then you had weapon systems just kind of show, showing up randomly. Let's try this. Let's throw that in. It was chaos and, and, and not the kind of chaos you need to win battles. Patton was big on chaos. Patton was very effective in the use of chaos. In this case, Judge, it was chaos for the, for the, with, with the wrong uh, or, or lack of focus. That's first. Secondly, policy. The White House never once established a series of of policy objectives which were achievable. Uh, again, it was uh, international virtue signaling, uh, essentially uh, people like the, the likes of David Petraeus, uh, General Hodges, uh, others uh, uh, who were essentially politi uh, politicians at the State Department, Victoria Newland. Uh, all these folks got together and, and basically created aspirations that were not, first off not achievable, and secondly, not in the interest of the United States. Essentially, they got us in the middle of what I believe to be a, a civil war. Uh, the Ukrainians and Russians are cut from the same cloth. I've said this multiple times. Uh, it was never in our policy interest to get into the middle of that. And third, most importantly, Ukraine uh, was up until the war, the most, the second most corrupt nation in, in Europe. Everybody recognized it, corruption up and down the line. And yet somehow we jumped in as their primary supporter and ally, thinking all of a sudden all that crime and, and internal problems are going to go away because we jump in. So those are the three th things that I think, uh, resulted in, uh, the, the defeat of uh, of ukraine regarding russia and i think it was inevitable we've talked about this judge for uh, over a year it, this there was no no way the ukrainians are going to prevail so the 113 billion that old joe sent there 40 billion more or less in cash the rest more or less uh in equipment was utterly and totally wasted cash stolen equipment destroyed misused not used strategically is that a fair summary i think uh a fair summary would say we have to audit where all of that went um that the appearance at this point is yeah it was all wasted uh, the biggest evidence the biggest fact that is apparent and undisputable is the offensive didn't work uh so what did we buy we bought failure and how did we what where did the money go to get us to the point of failure where did it go and i think to your point that 40 billion i mean where is it in our interest to be funding uh uh U ukrainian uh bohemian plays in the middle of cities in a war to make sure that their culture continues are you kidding mm -hmm. me mm -hmm. what is it in our interest to fund their civil service these are all things which have nothing to do with victory and i would argue it was a distraction. If you're in to win a war and you're funding plays in, in Ukraine and the civil service, that's not helping win the war. Did, so did, I, did, arguably, we need to find out where that money went. So, I mean, do you know of any recent experience like this in modern American history where in, assist, in addition to providing military assistance, we effectively funded the government? Question one. Question two, which is part of this. Did the Ukraine government continue to collect taxes? during the war, or did it rely solely uh, on the largesse of the American taxpayer to fund everything from civil service salaries to this type of um, uh, cultural activity that you're uh, yeah. mentioning? I don't know about the internal tax collection. I would presume, yes, uh, people like Zelensky and others who run governance never want to give up anything they have. 
And in this case, I would suspect that no, they continue to take taxes. It's just they've been spent on things other than uh, pr providing support and uh, help for the Ukrainian people. To the first point regarding, have we done this before? Oh yeah, it's become in our DNA. It's our now. It's our job now as uh, the U.S. military to essentially nation build, which I would argue, I I'm not saying I'm for it. I'm saying I'm against it. But I'm saying that that is what we have become as a military if we go in somewhere judge we then become the vector and uh, provider of, of of political uh uh perspectives based on whoever's in charge and and, mo and this is both left and right both left and right does this regarding democrats republicans afghanistan we came in once we achieved our, our specific uh, uh, initial victory in 2003 2001 2002 by 2003 my book talks about this we were moving into uh, counterinsurgency and nation building we decided we were going to make kabul like my not north dakota didn't work out so right. we do that now we this is what we do so it, it's not unusual. What's unusual in this case, Judge, is that we did it without us being there. That is to say, we we, we franchised it. We, we let Zelensky and his government figure out, hey, here's all the money. Go figure out how to use it, but do it in such a way that we will, we, we the United States, our policies are, are basically supported. So the situation in Ukraine now uh, is such that it was described by General Zeluzhny as a, as a stalemate. Since he made that description, the battle line has actually moved uh, west uh, a bit. Uh, and yeah. there have been some attacks uh, in Kiev. Uh, General Stoltenberg, the Gen Secretary General of NATO, has said there is bad news uh, in Ukraine. And the elites seem to be whispering. I don't know if, if this is Newland and Blinken and uh, and Sullivan, but the elites see in Brussels seem to be whispering below the radar screen uh, that it's over. So what value is there in sending another $68 billion, which Joe Biden wants and which the Congress is supposed to vote on before <laughs> Christmas, which means in the next two weeks? Of what conceivable value is there to send another sixty-eight billion in military aid to Ukraine? Zero. Uh, this is something I've spoken on several times. Uh, Congress needs to do what it, 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 its job is: is basically be the board of directors over the policies and interests of the United States. In this case, the board needs to say no more money until certain domestic issues are fixed. The, the border needs to be fixed. Period. And I believe Speaker Johnson's hard line on this is, is appropriate. We need to do that, period. And so uh, not another cent for Ukraine until the United States issues are resolved, or at least on the path of being resolved. Secondly, as I mentioned earlier, and I've described this in other interviews, is, is Dave Petraeus's wackadoodle policy, uh, strategy. There is no strategy until there is some idea, Judge, beyond uh, the talking heads that the... Uh, that the, the Kagans and, and the Institute of War, all these other folks, until they figure out something that's deeper than the the paper it's written on regarding a concept, you need to have a strategy. Uh, again, I'm not for or against either side. Uh, you know, I just don't think we should be involved. I'm not for Russia. I'm not against Russia. I'm not for Ukraine. I'm not against Ukraine. Do I? Putin's a thug. I say this all the time. I'm not pro-Russian. With that said. Uh, until we, the United States, uh, establish and understand specific objectives, Amer American objectives assigned to what we're trying to do, then we shouldn't be involved. Why are we there? What do we expect to achieve? If we see Ukraine uh, destabilize Russia, it's the other thing too, Judge, which is completely ignored by what? The, 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 the neocons. What, what if happened? we actually succeed in destroying Russia? What, what happens if Russia becomes ungoverned with nukes? Have you thought this through? Nobody thinks this stuff through. So, well, there doesn't seem to be any question, but that the Lindsey Graham's, Victoria Newlands, Tony Blinken's, etc., wanted to use Ukraine as a battering ram. We've used no this phrase many, many times, with which to drive President Putin from office, and it's having the opposite effect. The right. sanctions have strengthened Russia economically. The victories in Ukraine have strengthened uh, President Putin uh, politically. What right. happens uh, if um, the Congress does not vote the $68 billion? What becomes of the Ukraine government almost overnight? Well, 
Well, you got Lloyd Austin threatening to deploy U.S. forces in absence of money. I mean, this is, uh, he was asked this a couple of days ago. This has been covered by Breitbart. Think about that, Judge. Well, if you don't give us the money, we're just going to send troops in. <laughs> what? Yeah, well, but, it's, uh, unfortunate. it's unfortunate that um, power that the Congress gave to George W. Bush, which was inherited by his successors and is now enjoyed by Joe Biden, right, uh, and upheld by the Supreme Court, regrettably, uh, allows the, the president to shift money from column A to column B. So even if the United States does not give a directly to Ukraine, uh, the president can take it from somewhere else. And if he wants to send troops there, he has a war powers resolution issue, but he certainly uh, legally could send them unconstitutionally, in my view, immorally, in my view. But the law is, uh, is uh, what it is. How teetering on the brink uh, is President Zelensky um, himself. I mean, he has canceled elections for 2024. Uh, they don't allow anybody to leave the country, or, or at least not people subject to the draft. Who's subject to the draft? Everybody aged 17 to 70, male right. and female. Uh, he's publicly disputing with his, his chief general. The chief general's chief of staff was assassinated in his own home. How, how uh, unstable is the presidency of Vladimir Putin as we speak. Uh, excuse me, of, of Vladimir Zelensky as we speak. So I, I, think, uh, I, I think there's parallels between uh, the Soviets and Russia and the Soviets in Ukraine. Uh, in the old days, and I've said this several times, you can take the Soviet, you can take the man out of the Soviet, you can't take the Soviet out of the man. And deep down, the Ukrainians and Zelensky are cut from the same cloth as the Soviets. It's all, they were part of the Soviet Union. So this bare knuckle uh, assassination potential in politics is real. I think we've seen it. Uh, in Russia, you often, the, a retirement is usually six feet under the ground, apparently, if you're a senior political leader. So I don't see anything different here. There's clearly a battle going on between Zeluzhny, General Zeluzhny, and the military, and Zelensky over the, the future of the country. And uh, I think there's a good potential for uh, a, 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 a series of events which would see Zelensky, if not removed from office, uh, uh, marginalized to the point of where he's no longer able to function as president. Would that mean that he uh, becomes a victim of assassination? It's always possible. Because again, Judge, their political system, the way they do things, is completely different than ours. And I think that that, that is a good possibility. I think the ultimate uh, thing we're going to see play out is the military challenging the government. And that's going to, I think that's going to be what we'll see over the next uh, two or three weeks. How uh, does one explain the failure of American intelligence, as in the intelligence community, uh, in the American military, to misjudge uh, Ukraine's strength and underestimate Russian strength? Uh, Judge, we've talked about this a dozen times. It's not about the intelligence not being there. It's about the intelligence being avoided and downplayed. Uh, what I've said to you and, and your audience and to my, the other folks I talk to, the intelligence community is known. They've known it in more in, in detail at a higher classification level than I know. Uh, so what I've been saying they've known, it's all about aspirational uh, intelligence briefing. It, that is to say, you have leaders in the intelligence community who are afraid of telling the truth, and therefore they're not going to tell you, by the way, uh, all these uh, layers of defense the Russians are building up. Uh, you're not going to be able to penetrate those with what you've uh, planned to use. We've known this. this. This is not unknown. The reason that the failure has occurred is the same reason that the failure uh, to detect the 9-11 hijackers, the same failure that resulted in the, in the fall of Afghanistan, all these failures are policy. It's not intelligence. It's not about intelligence officers like me going out, figuring things out. It's not about analysts not sitting down with all the facts, trying to put the pieces together and preside, pr provide a mosaic, an effective mosaic of what's about to happen or what's happening. It's not the intelligence. It's the policy. You have far too many people, Judge, in the intelligence community who are completely tied and willing to compromise, tied mm -hmm. to the, the ruling political party and willing to compromise their integrity for purposes of, the, of personal political gain. That's what happened. It happened here. It's happened before. It'll happen again within the current system.
So in Turkey in March of 22, the Russians and the Ukrainians uh, had negotiations supervised by the right. Turks. I think there may have been some other countries there. And there was a handshake uh, agreement that uh, Ukraine would not uh, join NATO. Uh, Russian, the, the Russian eastern part of Ukraine would stay in some sort of a neutral but loosely allied with Moscow capacity and there would be no invasion. We, yeah. we all know that that agreement uh, was sabotaged by the U.S. and the U.K., and the person who uh, personally sabotaged it apparently was Boris Yeltsin, the then prime minister of the United Kingdom, who flew to Kiev and basically said to President uh, Zelensky, uh, the U.S. and the U.K. and NATO and the West have your back. Don't worry about it. We'll uh, win this war. None of that is in dispute. All of that is well-known history. Over right. the weekend the chief negotiator for Ukraine at those uh, negotiations acknowledged publicly what I have just described. So why would he do that unless he knows the end game is near? Well, I think you, you, you hit the nail on the head, Judge. The, the end game is near. Uh, you cu currently have a situation where Good faith negotiations would have either prevented the war or early on in the war, there was negotiations which would have essentially limited the, the conditions uh, of the continued uh, Russian offensive to the point of where there would have been a ceasefire and a, a beginning of a negotiated settlement. Let me be very clear on this. The Russians will not back down. They see the encroachment of NATO and the West into territories they control during the Cold War, the Warsaw Pact, as an existential threat. This is not negotiable. I'm not pro-Russian. I'm just telling you what the position is. This is something that the United States knows and NATO knows. And the Russians have acted on this, the specific concerns they have regarding buffers. This goes back to, uh, the, to the czars. This is not a new right. concept. Right. So what, what we're seeing now is the end game where you're going to have the West have to basically give in to the Russian desire for that protective space. The question becomes what happens because uh, this is going to leave Putin and the Russians in a position to do whatever they want with Ukraine, literally. I mean, they well, could Putin, march to the Zephyr, yeah. and it, it, it's all sorts of things they have the option of doing now. I, let me correct myself. I think I inadvertently said Boris Yeltsin a few minutes ago. You knew I meant Boris Johnson. I met, the, yes, I, I knew you met Johnson, yes. Right, yes. and I, I apologize for that and some of the uh, comments that they're having a field day with my boo-boo. One of them even called me comrade <laughs> my mother would love to see that um back to uh back to where we were yeah. um do the dc and brussels elites now recognize that the end game is here because the most bloodthirsty of all of them the guy who never met a war he didn't want somebody else to fight senator lindsey graham effectively said over the weekend I'm against all aid to Ukraine until we build a wall on the southern border. Now, that's the attitude that the Speaker of the House is taking. If yeah. that attitude, uh, is that attitude uh, the tip of the iceberg, or is this just Senator Graham playing politics? Graham always plays politics, and it's obvious. In this case, I think his politics and what's uh, necessary for the, the neocons to save face is one and the same. Uh, the neocons, like Lindsay and others, have an excuse. The, the, the beginning of the excuse started on the 7th of October. The one bright spot for the neocons was, oh, this distracts from Ukraine. Uh, so this, this has given them another war to go invest in. And I'm saying that with a level of, I'm going to get, I, I'm sure I'm going to get some in, in trouble for saying it. But yes, the, the, the Hamas conflict gave the neocons another focus and to say, oh, we have to focus on this now. We, we, and the border adds to the justification for the neocons step away. The other thing you're going to see, judges, don't look at the fact we failed in Ukraine. Oh, we have to go over here and look at this. We don't want to focus on the past. You're going to see that. Right. And Lindsey Graham and those folks are now trying to quietly 
uh, show Zelensky the door, hoping he doesn't make too much noise as they shove him out. Uh, and le- and Russia is going to have the option of returning to the offensive. Uh, they already do. Uh, they've already made some limited tactical gains. But by uh, March, they're going to have the ability to go all the way to the Dnieper with no problem and basically turn Ukraine into a rump state. I don't think they want all of Ukraine, by the way. I, I just don't no, think I they don't, do. I don't think they do either. I think the last thing uh, President Putin wants is a protracted guerrilla war and the obligation right. of governing. I think he absolutely he just wants those uh, sections east of the Dnieper River, which are culturally Russian, which he, right. he claims to have a legal claim to and, and historically has been back and forth between Russia uh, and and Ukraine for uh, hundreds of years. And it appears as though uh, that's what he's uh, that's what he's going to get. Uh, the New York Times uh, reports and I don't want to get into Gaza because we're nearly at the end of our time. I want your thoughts on uh, Gaza and the uh, Israelis the next time we chat. However, sure. uh, to put a bow on this, the New York Times on this box, the New York Times reports uh, that more civilians have been killed in Gaza in eight weeks than in Ukraine in 18 months. Fact number one. Fact number two, fewer than 100,000 Russian troops killed. 500,000 Ukrainian troops either killed or so disabled they can't uh, go back to the battlefield. So I know you're not a fan uh, of President Putin, but his generals are apparently professionals. They're not killing civilians. Um, yes. The, the, the military effort by the Russians, I think, has been very professional. And I'm not pro-Russian. Again, uh, Judge, I, I, ha- I always have to clarify this because people get upset otherwise. Putin is a thug. He has personally murdered reporters and elevators in Moscow. Don't get me wrong. With that said, the Russian military has tried to conduct itself within what they, the Russians, believe is a, a concerted military effort. Much of the messaging that's gone with the military effort by Russia has been focused not on the United States, but on the third world and other nations which are going to be looking to Russia as the, one of the new world leaders outside of the United States. That's so, so the reason the Russians are trying to play nice, if you consider not conducting war crimes nice, and by the way, I just watched the Merrick Garland uh, uh, press conference uh, claiming Russia committed war crimes. I'm sorry. That's a distraction. Uh, as much as maybe what they said today, Garland said uh, at the time we're taping this, it was about a half an hour ago, Garland did the press conference. Mm. It's a distraction. When you have a boss murdering women in truly horrific conditions, that should be the focus of the investigation. What war crimes were conducted against women on 7 October and is continuing to be c- perpetrated against them who are in captivity? By the way, quick aside on this, I know it's a distraction a little bit. The reason Hamas did not release all those women is because they don't want the media, U.S. media, global media, to be told about the atrocities they're doing. So uh, I, the fact is Garland is trying to drum up more hate against Putin right. when there are clear war crimes this, out there that should be investigated. This, this is part of the part of the Joe Biden mantra, just like That's, uh, giving weapons to Israel and telling them not to use them. Just like exactly. the other way, when Israel commits genocide, this is part of the of the Joe Biden mantra. When is he going to accuse Benjamin Netanyahu as, of being a war criminal? The evidence is ample. Tony, I'll let you go. Thank you very much. But I have to sure. tell you, the viewers are having a contest as to what kind of a car you are sitting in. <laughs> <laughs> You don't have to answer. I just want you. I don't want to cry. Well, into I, I, let me put it. It's, it's, it's all wheel drive and it's a turbo. So I'll leave it at that. They can figure uh, it out from there. Draw, wherever you are, wherever you're going, drive safely, drive carefully. Welcome back to the show. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Good to be here. Thanks, Judge.